All right, well, uh, this evening, as I told you this morning, we're going to uh, look at the next section of the Sermon on the Mount, and this is where Jesus uh, deals with the Sixth Commandment, and he applies it a bit more broadly than uh, perhaps the Pharisees and scribes believe that it, it could or should be, but certainly further than they actually applied it uh, in their own lives. So let's begin by reading the text, Matthew 5, verses 21 through 26. Jesus says, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you're with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. Uh, may the Lord again bless his word to our hearing uh, this evening. Now this morning uh, we heard Jesus tell us that unless our righteousness is greater than that of the scribes and the Pharisees, we will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, remember, we saw that Jesus fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the civil law, that law that kept Israel together as a distinct nation and a separate people uh, that was basically kept together until Jesus should come. He fulfilled it by his coming. Uh, they no longer needed to have that code because Jesus has completed his work. He fulfilled the ceremonial law when he was on the cross uh, and he made the perfect sacrifice, and he continues to fulfill it through his intercession from heaven. But particularly, he fulfilled the moral law through his perfect obedience. And the Lord did these things so that we could enter into the kingdom of heaven, so that we could have our sins forgiven, so that we could be given his perfect record of obedience, so that God could declare us just, in other words, that we have a title to heaven. But he also did it that we might have the power to live the kind of life that Jesus speaks about in this sermon, the kind of life that surpasses that of the religious leaders. Now again, that is the evidence we've been looking at uh, last month uh, that Jesus uh, tells us we should see if we have truly been justified, if we have really trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation or justification may be by grace through faith alone, but again, it is not by faith that is alone, but is always accompanied with good works. These are those good works, the kind that surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, we've seen the overall character that this grace will produce in our lives in the Beatitudes, but... What does it look like in terms of the law more specifically? Now, the Jewish leaders fell short in their teaching. They fell short in their lives and the example they were giving to the people of Israel. And so Jesus lifts the standard back to where God intended. And of course, as he does this, he really is answering the question, how our righteousness will be greater than that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, in terms of the law, and at the same time, he is telling us what he, through the gospel, has actually given us the power to do. And again, let's keep the gospel first. Jesus isn't saying, do this and you shall live, but he's saying that if you're able to do this by his grace, you are alive, and you will enter into his kingdom if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus. Now, he does begin this discussion with the Sixth Commandment, an area, I think, where we're going to see that we could all use some improvement. Uh, Jesus begins in verse 21. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, 
And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Jesus begins with what the scriptures actually say. I mean, this is the sixth commandment. You shall not commit murder. And those who commit murder, there are certainly consequences. There are penalties for this. Now, the sixth commandment on the face of it seems only to forbid murder, which is the unjust taking away of life. Now, it doesn't forbid killing, which is the just taking away of life, at least under certain circumstances, such as what the magistrates should do, I should say, what, I was going to say what the magistrates do, but today we have to say what the magistrate or what the government should do in using the power of the sword that the Lord has entrusted to them to execute those who have committed capital crimes, among which, of course, is the crime of murder. Or when they exercise the power of the sword by sending their military forces out against those who are intending to murder their citizens or to take their lives away unjustly. Uh, the Sixth Commandment does not forbid that. It also doesn't forbid us from fighting in such a war, if that war is a just war, nor from taking away someone's life to preserve our own or the life of our neighbor if someone is trying to take away our lives unjustly. Uh, so the commandment forbids murder, which is the unjust taking away of life. And Jesus says those who unjustly take away life should be brought to court and held accountable for their actions. Uh, just because we live in a society that seems to have forgotten this, we should be reminded what the Lord tells us is the penalty for murder. He says in Genesis 9, verse 6, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. So again, that's what the commandment means. But we do need to notice here that Jesus isn't simply speaking about what God said in the commandment. If he was, he would have used his more familiar expression as far as introducing uh, what he says. It is written. Rather, he's addressing here what the Jewish leaders were actually teaching according to the long-standing rabbinic tradition. Notice Jesus says in verse 21, you have heard that the ancients were told that is, those long ago were told this. And actually, it, it perhaps is more accurately translated this way. You have heard it said by the ancients. In other words, by the ancient rabbinic interpreters. This is what they believe the commandment means. Now, the rabbis tended to take the commandments, as we saw this morning, basically at face value. They didn't seem to see the true intent of the law, what it is that God really required. They did see what God was forbidding uh, prima facie, at least on the face of things, that we are not unjustly to take away life. But they believed that if they didn't do that, if they didn't murder, that they had kept this law, that they were righteous before God. They did what was right. They did everything that was required. Now, as we also saw this morning, there's always a tendency to lower the standard when you believe that your salvation is actually based on keeping that standard. I don't know if you've ever run into uh, or, or seen teachers who claim never to sin. Remember, there was a time when uh, I was listening to a Christian talk show. They had a teacher on there who believed that he had reached sinless perfection, and uh, he continued to uh, certainly claim that he had, uh, until they brought his wife on stage and asked her particular questions about his behavior and then realized, of course, uh, and pointed out to him that anybody can say they're sinless if they redefine what sin actually is. And that's what you have to do in order to maintain a sinless life, or at least that claim, and that's certainly what the Pharisees were doing. But Jesus tells us this isn't enough. He tells us that this commandment can actually be broken in other ways. Now, he doesn't give us uh, all the ways in which it can be broken, but he does point out one of the ways in which perhaps it is most often broken, and that is in our hearts. Notice what he says in verse 22. 
But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the courts. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. The Sixth Commandment not only forbids the unjust taking away of life, it also forbids sinful and unjust anger, the desire to take away life. Now, one thing we do need to recognize, and, and in saying this, I, I realize I'm going against perhaps what maybe others believe, but I, I do think this position is actually correct. Anger is not always sinful, though much of our anger is, and it can easily become that because it is an agitation of spirit. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, verses 26 and 27, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. So anger makes us perhaps more liable to sin, but he's telling us here it is possible to be angry and not to sin. It's just that when we're in this state, we need to be careful not to allow it to move in that direction. There is such a thing as a righteous anger the kind that has regard for God and for his glory. When somebody does something against God, when you see somebody blaspheme God or perhaps they do it to your face, they say something wicked about God, how can you be unmoved by that? It's going to create anger. You feel it when someone dishonors him and you want to do something to restore that honor and that is a righteous kind of anger. And one thing we also need to bear in mind, that a righteous anger will also have some regard for the one who is offending, that we don't want to jump on them and tear them to shreds, as it were, but rather we want to do what we can also to help them, to restore them, if possible. I think the imprecatory Psalms reminds us that sometimes it isn't, and the unpardonable sin reminds us that sometimes that is the case. But you see, Jesus here is talking about the kind of anger that is clearly wrong, the kind of anger that wants revenge, that wants to hurt that person, that doesn't have God's honor in view, or your neighbor's well-being. Now, Jesus tells us that it can vary in degree. It begins in the heart. The word that's actually used here doesn't mean just that you're sort of slightly perturbed, but it means you're furious with your brother. As it develops, it can eventually make its way to our mouths and we begin to say things, you know, express things that are hurtful and demeaning. Remember how Jesus says out of the, out of the uh, basically out of the heart or what comes out of the mouth comes out of the, out of the heart, right? It's what's in your heart, it's what's in your affections. And affections can be negative as well as positive. Well, it can make its way to our mouths and we can say some things that are rather demeaning. Uh, the word, the first word used here is raka, which means empty-headed fool. And apparently it was a term of derision in those days. Or we could say something perhaps even worse. The second word used here is moros. I don't know if that sounds familiar uh, to you, but it is the Greek word from which we get the word moron, which means worthless fool. Now, Jesus tells us here that to be angry is to be liable to the court. To say that Raka is to be liable to the Supreme Court, to say Moros is to be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell, but we, we do need to understand here that Jesus is not saying that only the last one deserves hell. He's actually saying all three of them do. All of them make us liable to the court and to judgment. Now, maybe we haven't actually murdered our neighbor, as, as the Pharisees were thinking. I haven't murdered anyone. But have we been angry with them in our hearts? Have we wanted to hurt them? Have we injured them with our tongues? Now, again, Jesus is addressing a couple of things here. He, he is saying something about what we say to one another, certainly, that we're not to use our words to tear each other apart but rather we are to use them to build each other up. Paul writes in Ephesians 
And this is something we are to observe at all times. He says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. How often are we to do that? All the time. There is never to be an unwholesome word coming out of our mouths. And Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 9, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. You know what? These two passages are actually talking about how we should treat brothers and sisters in the Lord. But Jesus tells us that we are to extend this even to our enemies. He says, actually, we're going to see it later in this same Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verses 43 through 45. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You see, God doesn't just love those who love him. He's good to all his creatures, even to his enemies, and we are to do the same. So instead of returning insult for insult, we are to return a blessing instead and pray for those who actually hate us. Now, again, we don't do that to be saved. If we are saved, we have the ability to do that. Uh, and I'm not saying it's going to be easy. We still have the flesh that we have to contend with, but we need to realize when our flesh tells us no, and the Spirit is telling us, yes, love your enemies, you need to yield to the Spirit. We all need to yield to Him and draw from Him the strength to be able to do what we know Jesus would do if He were in our place. Now, Jesus, as I've said, is addressing how we use our speech, but He really does have His finger on what is in our hearts what it is that's making us want to say, the things that we would say, the source of the bad language that may come out of our mouths, that hatred that we have against our neighbors, the hatred that breaks the sixth commandment and would bring us into judgment, but for God's grace. Now again, as I said before, Jesus really isn't, um, isn't saying that there's a difference uh, in these different judgments. They all deserve God's judgment, uh, varying degrees, but, but certainly all of them make us guilty. And Jesus also, when he makes this distinction between killing somebody and hating somebody, is not telling us that there's no difference between those two things. I mean, sometimes we read these, these distinctions, you know, okay, you've heard don't commit murder, but if you're angry, then you've murdered your brother in your heart. Jesus is not saying those two things are the same thing, getting angry and wanting to kill somebody versus actually killing them, because murder does take away life, and at the same time can take away the support that, that that person might have been providing for those under his care, his dependents. I mean, murder makes a difference. What that gunman did when he went in there is different. If he came in and he just hated Christians and said something nasty, that's one thing. But if he comes in and actually kills them, that's something entirely different and much more severe. Hating them might not hurt them at all if it stays in the heart. But Jesus is telling us that hatred still deserves judgment. It's still breaking that commandment. Now, again, remember what we saw during the Reformation series, you know, Rome and all the distinctions they made between uh, venial sins and mortal sins. They were recognizing that there are different distinctions in sin, different degrees of sin. But contrary to what Rome believes, that some sins deserve death while others don't, the Bible actually teaches that every sin, is a mortal sin. We, we saw that before. Every sin is a mortal sin. Every sin would kill us, could kill us, and does kill those outside of Jesus Christ. But because of God's grace toward us in Jesus, they will not kill us. So 
if we kill somebody, that deserves death. And actually, if we hate somebody unrighteously in this way, that deserves death as well. But again, no matter what we may fall into uh, as believers, God's grace is enough to cover all of our sins. But Jesus does want us to see that it is a serious matter. By the way, I need to mention this as well, because whenever we talk about grace and the fact that it covers all of our sins, we might be tempted to think it doesn't matter then how I live, but it does matter. The fact that Jesus paid for our sins never excuses our sin or gives us an excuse to sin. Paul writes in Romans 6 verses 1 and 2, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? And again, the idea is, as my sin increased more and more, God's grace was shown to be greater and greater. So Paul is saying, well, should we use that as an argument then to sin so that God can show his grace and he can glorify his grace? He says, may it never be. May that be the furthest thing possible from, from our thinking and what we should do. He said, how shall we who died to sin still live in it. Forgiveness of sin is not a reason to sin. It's a reason why we should not sin. It's a reason why we should repent. Our sins nailed Jesus to the cross. He died because of our sins. When he died, we died with him to sin. And when we were raised again to life, when he was raised, we were raised to a new kind of life. His spirit lives in us. So how can we continue to live in sin? How can we continue to allow ourselves to sin? We can't. So what would Jesus then have us to do? Well, rather than hating others, Jesus tells us we should be reconciled to them. We are to apply that principle, as I said before, to, to everyone. Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 18, if possible... So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. In other words, you don't be the one provoking, you be the one who is the peacemaker. Remember, we saw blessed are the peacemaker. The peacemakers because they shall inherit the earth. Jesus was sowing peace, not strife, not discord. That's what he wants us to do among all men. And we've already seen what Jesus had to say, of course, about loving our enemies. But I do want us to notice again here his specific application in verse 22 with regard to who it is um, he's directing this towards, I guess whom it is he's directing this towards. He says in verse 22, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool, and I think the implication here is we should read to his brother, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Jesus really is speaking here about our relationship to our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to be reconciled to each other, to be at peace with each other. Uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That takes a lot of work. I think you understand that. To... Uh, maintain this kind of relationship with one another. It's not going to be automatic because we sometimes give offense to one another. And when that happens, we need to make sure that we deal with it the way that we should. Jesus wants us to keep short accounts with each other. Uh, he goes on to say in our passage in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 24, therefore... If you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Remember how Paul told us earlier that we're not to let the sun go down even on our righteous anger. 
because it will give the devil an opportunity? Well, Jesus tells us here that we shouldn't let our, uh, our odds being at odds with a, a brother or sister in the Lord go for even a week. Uh, before we come to worship the Lord, we need to deal with our outstanding offenses. Now, notice he says, if, if there you realize your brother has something against you, maybe you got angry. You know, maybe you lashed them with your tongue. Maybe you murdered them in your heart and it was expressed in a way that, that gave some real offense. If we know they have something against us, we need to go to them. You know, again, uh, whether that offense is, is genuine, whether it's, it's only imaginary, I think we should try to go and work it out with them, Jesus says, before we come and worship. And by the way, the worship he's expressing here is not the kind of worship we would do today. We're not bringing a gift to an altar, but he's talking about in terms of, of what they were doing to worship the Lord in those days, and certainly the application would be for us with regard to our coming to worship the Lord. We need to be reconciled. Now, if we realize our brother or sister is, is offended at us and we go to them and we seek to be reconciled to them, will it always end in reconciliation? Well, sadly, it, it doesn't always. But at least we have to try. We can't guarantee the result, but the Lord wants us to make the effort. I mean, think about this for a minute. If we had to be reconciled to everyone who might have something against us before we could come and worship the Lord, we'd never be able to come. I'm not sure that any of us have, you know, really no one anywhere that is offended at us for something. But the point is we need to have tried to go to them and try to reconcile with them. And sometimes people are irreconcilable. Sometimes they won't forgive but that should never be the case, of course, with us. Now, Jesus also addresses the question, what if we're not willing to go and ask forgiveness of those we know that we have offended, we know that are offended at us? Well, Jesus says this in verses 25 and 26. That's what he's actually addressing here. He says, make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you're with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. Now Jesus here is using an illustration of an earthly court to tell us the same thing is true of the heavenly court. If we refuse to go and seek to be reconciled to our brother, we're gonna be handed over to the judge and thrown into his prison and will not come out until we have paid the last cent. I don't know if that sounds familiar to you, but Jesus is essentially saying the same thing that he says in the parable of, of the servant, you know, who's forgiven the 10,000 talents and then he refuses to forgive the other servant, fellow servant that only owes him a few denarii. Um, and then when the master finds out what his servant didn't do, he didn't forgive then he calls him to account for that 10,000 talents and he puts him into the prison until he pays back everything. What Jesus is telling us here is that the same thing is true here as when we're unwilling to forgive others. He tells us at the end of the Lord's Prayer this in Matthew 6 verses 14 through 15, which is the same thing that he says at the end of that parable in Matthew 18 about the unforgiving servant. He says, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. If you're unwilling to forgive, then you will not be forgiven. Essentially, you are not forgiven. If we're not willing to go and seek re reconciliation with our brothers when we know that we have offended them, the Lord says he will not be reconciled to us either. Now again, let's remember what this means in terms of the gospel. Jesus gives us the power to forgive through the gospel, through his spirit who lives in us. If we can forgive others and if we do forgive others, it means that we have his spirit 
in us, living in us. It shows that we are actually forgiven. When Jesus says, if you don't forgive others, your heavenly Father isn't going to forgive you, he doesn't mean our forgiving earns our own forgiveness, but rather it's the evidence that we have been forgiven. It's, it's that fruit, that faith that is not alone. In the same way, Jesus in the gospel gives us the power by his same spirit to humble ourselves and to ask forgiveness from those we have offended. Our doing that does not earn our reconciliation, but it is the evidence that we are reconciled to God. And so really the question we need to ask ourselves this evening is, what kind of a heart do we have? How do we deal with these kinds of situations? Do we have the kind of heart that is willing to go and to be reconciled to people that we have offended? If we do, God has had mercy on us, and we should thank him for that. That's not a work that we've done by our own power that brings salvation down to us. That is God's mercy on our lives through the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the evidence that we have been justified. Are we struggling in this department? I think all of us struggle in this department. Uh, If that's the case, remember, the Lord has made every provision for us in the gospel to give us what we need to do what he has actually called us to do. We need to ask him for his strength and he will give it to us. But are we unwilling to do this? Are we unwilling to love a brother or sister? Are we unwilling to humble ourselves and go to them and ask them for their forgiveness? Now that's a very dangerous situation to be in, not whether we're struggling in this area, knowing we need to do it, wanting to do it, but then finding within ourselves some difficulty, but we just flat out don't want to do it and we are not going to do it. If that's the case, then pray that the Lord might have mercy on you and give you this kind of heart because this is what it means to be a Christian. This is a part of the image of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God does not work just parts of that image in us but leave other parts out. He gives us the whole package at one time. We are in every way like Jesus but not to the degree that Jesus is which means we will have this ability to some degree and if we don't find any of it within us it means that we still stand in need of God's mercy. So if we are unwilling to humble ourselves, if we're unwilling to go to an offended brother or sister and ask for their forgiveness, we need yet to experience the grace of God and we can only do that by coming to Jesus and casting ourselves on him and asking for his mercy and grace to change our hearts and give us the ability to do that. Well, let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to um, help us respond in, in the way that we need to according to what we see within ourselves.